Welcome everyone to this week's BAA Wednesday webinar. Uh, as always, this is being recorded and will be available on YouTube after the presentation. And also we'll be doing Q&A, but the Q&A will be done using the button at the bottom of your screen and will be, be after the presentation. So feel free to write questions as, you, as the presentation goes along and we can come to them later. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Stuart Coulter this week. Um, He's the Outreach Officer and Vice President of WOLAS, the West of London Astronomical Society, um, who I know very well because um, they were my local society when I was growing up and my um, interest in astronomy was starting. And um, he'll be talking on Cook, the Transit of Venus and Arth Aftermath and Legacy tonight. Thank you, Stuart. Okay, thanks, Andy. Uh, I should say that my interest in Cook was a result of a visit with the West of London Astronomical Society to Greenwich. Uh, it, that is to say, Hurstmanstow Castle, back in the 1980s, when in the library I handled Cook's Journal. Um, it sparked my interest, actually it was more like a lightning bolt, and I, I'm fascinated by Cook ever since. And this has been refreshed by a visit over the Christmas period of New Year to Australia. We spent a month there, my first visit, and uh, I was very keenly interested in the, in the history and two highlights many highlights in fact, but two of the great highlights were visiting Botany Bay itself and also visiting the replica of the Endeavour in, in Sydney. Um, you've got to remember that, uh, oh, another thing I could mention is that since retiring 10 years ago from teaching, I uh, became a volunteer at the Greenwich Observatory uh, at the Great Equatorial Telescope. And you learned there that Greenwich, the Greenwich Observatory was uh, commissioned uh, basically to aid navigation, to put a clock in the sky. And uh, you can't but uh, become fascinated by the Allied maritime history, which is associated with those fantastic 18th century voyages and since. Well, that's the iconic painting that is in Melbourne at the uh, National Gallery of Victoria. But I hope you've had time to look for the two 2006 version by Daniel Boyd Cook. This is a very heroic version of this story, very much from a British point of view, but uh, the, the painting that Boyd has done is very much uh, from the indigenous population's perspective. He's portrayed as a, uh, as a pirate with an eye patch over his eye. Uh, the, the flag is replaced by the skull and crossbones. Otherwise, it's basically the same with uh, actually Boyd's friends uh, are, are the personages in the painting. Uh, the only thing that I would ask you to look at here carefully is the two indigenous men here who welcomed them, <laughs> welcomed, um, who greeted them, who met them. Uh, I'll, I'll refer to them again later. Now, anytime you go to a museum, uh, this is something that you see everywhere. There's a very different awareness these days in Australia of the indigenous people's pasts. And all over the place, you see apologies of this sort, uh, stating, um, naming the, the, the peoples who inhabited the land before uh, it was colonized. Um, that's in the Botanical Gardens in Sydney. And here's an outline of the talk. Now, just bear with me a moment. I've got two screens on the go. And I've got one with my presenter's notes. And uh, here we are. Yeah. OK. So that's an outline of the talk. You can just look at that for yourselves. I don't have to read it out. I think some of the latter part I, I, I shan't have time for, but let's move on. Uh, that's my favourite portrait of Cook by a long mile. Um, it's a very good one. It's at Greenwich Observatory. And here's the journal, which, which I think I handled. I'm not entirely sure, and I'm looking into that as a matter of interest. Now, Cook wasn't the first European to visit Australia by any means. Uh, Dirk Hogarth, he was the first... Dutchman, the first European to uh, set foot on Australian soil in October 1616. 
Uh, he was near Perth and he put this pewter dish on a tree. It was collected eight years later. It's now to be found in the Rix Museum in Amsterdam uh, and that is where I, I photographed it. Cook first saw Australia. Uh, this is the point of land which they was first sighted by Lieutenant Hicks. His reward for spotting, for sighting the land was twofold, a gallon of rum in the short term and the point was named after him in the long term. And that is the point of the landing itself in Botany Bay. That's the uh, monument. Uh, there were events there which I haven't followed up yet because the 250th was marked in Australia uh, on the 28th of April and I've yet to follow up what the nature of those celebrations, if I want to call it that, were. That's a drawing of the time, in fact it's 1872, you can see there's a bit of artistic license and there we've got the two men again. Now on the monument it does quote from his logbook and it gives the latitude and longitude that he recorded and it was very interesting to see this because you can see there he was resting throughout his journey even when he was in the Indian Ocean he still gave his longitude in terms of degrees west of Greenwich. So 280 degrees 37 minutes west of Greenwich corresponds to 151 degrees 23 minutes east so I took out my phone to do a check on the accuracy and you can see there if you look um, where is it? There in the middle. Uh, latitude 34 degrees 16 seconds, 16 seconds out, but that was sheer luck because he was so close to the line of latitude itself. He was about 300 meters out there. Uh, but the longitude he gives us 151 degrees 13 minutes 3 seconds. So compare that with what he recorded, there's a difference of just 10 minutes of arc. Uh, 10 minutes of arc corresponds to a distance of 10 miles, 10 statute miles, in fact, at that latitude. And if he was using a clock, had he used H4, Harrison 4, that would have corresponded to a 40 second time drift. Now, in fact, H4 would have been 20 seconds out after 20 months. It's, uh, it, it kept time to about a second a month. So he would have been accurate, his position would have been precise to five miles, whereas using the sky and the clock, using the lunar distance method, favoured by Maskelyne, you can see he was only twice as far out, 10 miles out, equivalent to a 40 second time drift. Uh, I, I find that quite impressive because you can see that the, the uh, nautical, sorry, the lunar distance method is actually extremely good. Harrison 4 was the clock that uh, it was the, you'll see an image of it shortly, but Harrison 4 was the uh, large pocket watch size version of his clocks. He would have taken it to Australia on this voyage, except that it was in the hands of Kendall who was duplicating it because Harrison made the clock, he designed the clocks and Kendall basically manufactured them. So he was copying H4 when uh, Cook was on this voyage. He did have uh, K1 on his next two voyages, uh, but on this one, he was using the masculine method and you can see that it's good. The, the only problem with it is that it takes about half an hour to get your results from your observations. And also 40 seconds time drift is uh, what uh, the error was here. So that means they must have been able to, to, to time local noon to an accuracy of about 20 seconds. And then also to make an observation of whatever astronomical event was in the nautical tables to a similar accuracy combined, they, they, they combined to give you something like about a 40 second um, error, which as I say, surprised me when I, when I saw it was that good. And 10 miles is, is fine because on charts in those days, um, surveyors, uh, they were trained to draw the outline, the profiles of islands, so that if they got within 10 miles, they looked at the profile and they could identify it as the target they were aiming at. Now, I can't remember if that's H4 or if it's K1, and if Kendall did a good job, I shouldn't be able to. That's Botany Bay itself. Not a very pretty place. It's the backyard of, of, of Sydney. And I think that dustbin on the left-hand side was included for a purpose. But what was magnificent was actually seeing what Banks saw, seeing the flora and fauna there, which so inspired him. 
And quite interestingly, uh, if you're flying into Sydney from the south, then Kernel, if you can see there just under the flight path, just above the double L is where Cook landed. And it's actually the first bit of land that you will see landing from the south into Sydney Airport. And there's the view itself. That's me actually flying out, but it amounts to very much the same thing. And of course, as a result of all this, as a result of the, the voyage to uh, uh, Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus, he had secret instructions to go on to look for Terra Australis incognita. Uh, instead, he charted New Zealand and he charted Australia, claimed it. And as a result of this astronomical event, uh, Australia became part of the British dominions. I can't think of any astronomical event which had such an important role in shaping world history. If anybody can think of something similar, do please uh, chat with Andy and he'll pass on the message at the end. Now, let's get to Cook's early career. Uh, he was born in Yorkshire in Martin to the son of a, a farm laborer and his mother was local. His father rose to become farm manager. At the age of 18, he left home and worked in a grocer's on the coast, but the lure of the sea drew him, and within a year, he was on board Colliers, taking coal from London to uh, Middlesbrough area, and later into the Baltic. Um, he realised that his prospects would be better in the Royal Navy, so he joined the Royal Navy after nine years, and early on went across to Northern America. He chartered the St. Lawrence Seaway, and his charts were so good they, and so important that they helped General Wolfe here, that's his statue at Greenwich. Um, his charts helped uh, General Wolfe take Quebec from the French uh, in the Battle of the Heights of Abraham. So as well as being responsible for Australia being a British dominion, he's also in good part responsible for Canada being a British dominion. He risked his life charting at night, and he was nearly killed by some of the indigenous Indians there. Something else he did when he was in Newfoundland, he produced charts which were still in use in my lifetime. Uh, it took satellite technology to improve better charts than he produced by hand back in the late 1800s. But one thing that he did do when he was in Newfoundland, he observed an eclipse of the sun. And this is the site, and this is Espinac's page of uh, recording what, um, what Cook will have seen. But Cook observed this eclipse, took measurements, and when he returned to London, he got in touch with a friend who had links to the Royal Society. And through these links, these results were reduced, and the position where Cook observed this uh, eclipse was determined to within an accuracy of its position to date, an accuracy of three miles. So three miles in 3000 miles across the ocean. Again, a terrific testament to the quite unprecedented ability that uh, Cook had in charting and in observing precisely. Okay, transit of Venus. David Arditi posted on Facebook on the 3rd of December that he, he took an image of Venus. So I went out the next evening and there is a image of Venus, which you might just be able to see there, four degrees above the horizon. And that's an image which David uh, took. He showed that at World Us when we were still meeting, those were the days. Um, and here's another one that he took. And I like David's comment. He said that sometimes, you know, David is a consummate uh, planetary imager, but I like what he said of this image, that sometimes the simplest images aren't the most beautiful. And here are some winning images from Martin, uh, Martin Lewis. That won him the uh, planetary uh, section in the Inside Photographer of the Year. I think that was 2018. And these are other ones taken recently. And that's a quite incredible image that he took when, when, when Venus was in conjunction with the sun on the 6th of June. So that was taken just five days before inferior conjunction. And I'll show you how close Venus was to the sun at that time and why. But, uh, and of course that was taken in broad daylight. Yes. Um, 
Martin produced uh, uh, a, a talk that was broadcast yesterday. I'm looking forward to it. I, I couldn't see it last night, but it's on the virtual astronomy series with Dave Eagle. Again, on the sheet at the very end of the talk, I've got a link to that um, because the address is it's very long. Uh, you'll just have to copy it and key it in. But uh, Martin was imaging the surface, the temperature of the surface of Venus, and I'm intrigued to, to see how he did that. Okay, those are the image that I took on the 4th of February, and there's the ecliptic. And three weeks later, I went to Australia, and here's the image I took there. So, let me just catch up my other screen. So, that's the, uh, that's the ecliptic in Australia. And uh, you can see the ecliptic is at a much higher angle to the horizon, which is why only a couple of weeks later, Venus was so high in the sky. Now, during Furloff, the early days of Furloff, I really didn't have anything better to do with my time. So I played about with these two images. And of course, it's not the, it's not the ecliptic whose angle has changed, but it's our horizon. It's our horizon. And it struck me that whereas I've only moved 90 degrees south, if I look at the familiar sky, it's actually inverted by 180 degrees. I'll let you work that out for yourselves. Now, that is how close Venus was to the sun on the 3rd of June. And in fact, I'm wrong there, Martin, I'll take it back. You took that image two days before inferior conjunction, not five days, even more remarkable. Um, that's wrong, it's 224.7 days. Don't believe everything you see on the internet. But uh, on the 3rd of June, on the 3rd of June, uh, Venus was at inferior conjunction. Uh, that's an image I took in 2004. I say not to scale because Venus is three times closer than the sun. So Venus appears to be three times larger. That's more like, if you like, the, the size of Neptune or Uranus compared to the sun than Venus, which should be the third of the size. Now, transits have, oh, there have only been eight since the invention of the telescope, eight. And uh, they occur in alternate pairs a bit more than a century apart. And uh, let me explain that, uh, why that is, the, the cadence. Uh, an inferior conjunction has to occur either in early June or early December when the planes of Venus and Earth's orbit cross, otherwise it passes above or below. And in fact, it can pass quite a lot higher or quite a lot lower than the sun, because although its plane might be three degrees to the sun, from the Earth, that appears to be nine degrees. And a quick calculation, it can pass in about 18 degrees wide. The sun occupies only half a degree, so it's only one in, uh, one in 36 conjunctions that are going to result in a transit. As they're 1.6 years apart, that means they're only gonna happen every 58 years, which is pretty well the average. I've also said here down below, the 1.6 years is 21 months. So the moon has had 21 more chances to uh, occult the, 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 um, the planet than, um, than, than a transit occurring. So that would mean that they should happen every three years. If, if, if transits happen every 60 years, you should get a, um, a sorry, a, um, uh, uh, occultation every every three years or so. So let's just look at this cadence. Let's go through this quickly, but it's quite illuminating. Uh, there we've got the windows of 6th of June, 6th of December. If there's a conjunction at, at either of those dates, you'll get a transit. But here we are at the bottom, January the 1st, there's Venus, there's no transit. There's a conjunction, but no transit. Now, the time between inferior conjunctions is that which is 1.599 years. Let's call that 1.6 years. If it's 1.6 years, then the Earth will rotate around the Sun 1.6 times, 1 and 3 fifths times before the next conjunction. And again, it's not in that window, so you'll get no transit. Again, 1 and 3 fifths um, orbits around the, the Sun and you'll find that the Earth is in position three. Again, no transit, position four, position five, position six, and you're back to square one. 
Now, if it was 1.6 years exactly, that pattern would repeat ad infinitum and we would never get a transit. However, it's 1.599 years, so Venus gets back a little bit earlier, a couple of days earlier. So that is the position it gets back to uh, when it gets back to square one, as I've called it, position six, position seven, position eight, nine, ten. So that's a, a series of um, 10 conjunctions over 16 years. Let's look at the next 16 years. Again, no transit. Again, no transit. But now you can see the two transits, five transits, sorry, five conjunctions or eight years apart are going to result in the transit. And then I got tired of rotating this uh, pentagram, but you can see there at the top that uh, after a number of um, more cycles, there are going to be a pair of uh, transits in December before some 220 years later, you'll get this pair at the bottom uh, transiting again in June. So that explains the cadence. And there we are, 2004, 2012. And there, I think you can see how that occurs, 2004, 2012, 2020. And okay, you've seen that already. That's a, an image in 2004 by projection. So 1631, the, the, the first one to be observed was uh, 1639, Jeremiah Horrocks, who has got a memorial in Westminster Abbey facing uh, Sir Isaac Newton's tomb and now facing um, Stephen Hawking's as well. And it's the very last thing that you see on exiting the, uh, the Abbey. I think you all know about Horrocks. If you don't look him up, he was an absolute genius who did so much, yet died at the age of 22. Uh, one wonders how he would have stood in comparison to Newton had he survived. Okay, we know the story. Copernicus put, his forward, put forward his idea in 1543 that the sun was at the center of the solar system. Galileo produced the telescopic evidence, uh, Brahe the observations, Kepler the laws, and Newton the, uh, the, the explanation in uh, his law of universal gravitation and planetary motion. So they had the scale model of the solar system because uh, Kepler's third law related the time period of a planet to its radius of orbit. You can measure the time period very accurately if you look at the historic records. So you've got the radius. And if in fact, the, the actual expression is T squared equals R cubed, if T is measured in years and R is measured in astronomical units, then it's a very simple equation to convert the time to the distance of the, uh, the radius of planet's orbit in astronomical units. But of course, we've got a wonderful scale drawing of the solar system with one thing missing, and I think you know what that is, the scale. So it was Halley who realized that the best way of finding the scale of the solar system was to observe a transit of Venus across the face of the sun from two places on Earth. And you can see the geometry there. If you know the time, to, if you know, if you can measure the angular distance, the parallax of Venus, given the uh, vertical displacement between the northern observer and the southern observer, you can work out the distance to Venus and therefore you've got your scale. And it was realized the best way of, of, of measuring that angle was actually timing the transit from ingress to egress from those two positions. Now, if we take a look at uh, this simultaneous uh, images taken from Svalbard, 80 degrees north in Canberra, uh, in Australia, showing the Venus parallax effect, uh, separated by 11,600 kilometers, you can see there that there is a significant difference. And uh, sorry, that's the image that I, I was referring to. And um, right, let me just speed this one up because this is, I think it's SOHO, it's a sun synchronous satellite that imaged it. Okay, it's a bit slow, so I'm gonna drag it. You can see there, there was a bit of a storm there. Coronal mass, oh dear, let's go back. But once I've got Venus, I'll drag it across quickly and you can see it wobble. Basically, this satellite is in a sun synchronous orbit. It's going over. Okay, you've seen the composite. Let's move on. 
Um, the first expeditions took place in 1761, but this occurred during the Seven Years' War, where the French and the Germans and the British, they were at war all over the world, basically the First World War. And um, there are some stories that I refer to in the sheet at the end, uh, which I don't have time for now, but, um, but it, it basically didn't work. Um, but it was a good practice for 1769. I think those of us who observed the transit in 2004, it was such perfect conditions, uh, we might have treated it as practice for 2012. Of course, we were thwarted here in England at least and elsewhere. But um, anyway, what they learned the lessons in 1761 that were applied in 1769. And we all know about Captain Cook's ex expedition, but there were hundreds and hundreds the world over. They, they, they went here everywhere to uh, Hudson Bay up to uh, the, the north of Norway. These are British expeditions, but it's Cook's which is known because of course of the, uh, what happened afterwards. Um, so, to do this, the Royal Society put together a, an appeal for money to King George III, appealing for money. And it does make a very interesting read. This is a transcript from the um, Royal Society, which I visited. But it's, it's, it's quite enlightening. Of course, King George III, he was an enlightened king. It was the height of the Enlightenment. He was the first to have a formal scientific education, first monarch to have a formal scientific education. Um, some of you may remember the wonderful collection of instruments that was exhibited at the Science Museum, hundreds of beautiful brass instruments, but uh, they are now in store or traveling the world. But here he says that uh, thus as far as, you know, trying to persuade the king to fork out 4,000 uh, pounds. Mr. Jeremiah Horrocks, he's pulling on his patriotic um, purse strings here, seems to have been the first person since the creation of the world, not God's creation of the world, it was a rational society since the creation of the world, who calculated the passage of the planet because Horrocks reworked Halley's calculations. Halley didn't think there would be uh, a transit in 39. Um, the young Horrocks revised those calculations and he observed them. Uh, the British nation have been justly celebrated in the learned world for their knowledge in astronomy, in which they are inferior to no nation upon earth, ancient or modern, and that it will cast dishonor, that's a lovely word, upon them should they neglect to have correct observations made of this uh, important phenomenon. And I did ask the then president of the Royal Astronomical Society where in Britain's position was, and he said that we're still second to none, apart from the Americans when it comes to volume, but uh, the second to none when it comes to value for money. And uh, they got their £4,000 from the king. They came back with change and the Royal Society spent it on this bust of King George, which you will pass on the way to the library in the Royal Society. There it is. And Endeavour returned with world altering knowledge of navigation, mathematics, geology, geography, botany, psychology, nutrition, astronomy, medicine, cartography, languages, and those wild new lands at the end of the earth. Wow. And the king observed the, the, the uh, egress, the end of the, um, of, of the transit from this observatory, which he had built a queue, which Howard Brown Greaves, well as member, spotted in an estate agent's for let, for hire, for rent. And uh, to cut a long story short, we arranged a visit and we were actually privileged to be the very first members of the general public ever, I believe, to, to, to visit. And this is Robbie Brothers, who owns the lease at the moment. And uh, he showed us around. And that's incidentally is the um, uh, commemorates the, the um, transit in 1769, where incidentally, despite all the problems that all of the other observers around the world had with the black drop, all seven observers agreed with the king uh, to his timing to within one second. How true is that? That's the inside of the observatory. And you know, that is the prototype for every observatory of its type in the world. It, it's standard where we get so used to it. It's a dome, hemispherical dome that rotates with an opening slit. This was the prototype. Uh, the day after, the day after the transit, in fact, hours after the transit, there was an eclipse of the sun in Q. And at one moment, and this is a reproduction in, in Stellarium, but at one moment, the, the moon was 
eclipsing both the sun and Venus at the same time. How remarkable was that? Of course, it wasn't observable in the Pacific, but there's no record of it being observed at Q. There's the famous black drop, which I will talk about as needs be. And there's the voyage which Cook undertook. No time for much of the detail there. And that is the ship which he sailed in. It's the replica, which is in Sydney Harbour at the National Maritime Museum there in Sydney. And it was a second highlight, historical highlight of, of the, the trip. Uh, I was told 11 kilometers of rigging above the deck there. I read the other day, looking at it again, 27 kilometers. It's not the Cutty Sark, which is a very elegant ship, uh, which sailed at high speed, 18, 19 knots it could achieve. This just plodded along at seven knots, but it was a mule. It was chosen for its capacity. It was a, the same sort of ship that Cook sailed when he was working on Collies at the start of his career. Wonderful technology. That's the inside. And it was chosen because being a coal ship, it had huge amounts of storage. Um, it also had a flat bottom, which proved itself to be very important when they beached on the barrier reef and had to beach on the, on, on the, on, on the shore for five weeks to effect repairs. So it was modified and uh, we could see the modification. Here's the captain's cabin laid out with, with uh, Banks's drawings. Banks's drawings because um, uh, he wanted to go on the second and third voyages on condition that he could have the captain's cabin, but for reasons I don't have time for, he was refused. No surprises there. He paid, by the way, £4,000 for his entourage. He had a party of um, six plus four servants, and of those, uh, he, he, he lost uh, Charles Green, his astronomer, his three artists, two of his servants, they died. I guess they were less hardy than the others. So his attrition rate for his party was quite a lot. So £4,000 from the king, £4,000 for his passage with his entourage. And uh, the Navy paid about £4,000 on the ship, buying the ship, converting it, uh, to convert it into a Royal Navy ex ex uh, vessel of exploration of scientific exploration. And those are the plans. It's the most faithful replica of a sailing ship uh, of that period because they've still got the plans in Greenwich and I was going to uh, be there in person giving this talk at Greenwich to the Flamsteed in, in, in fact, and uh, they had agreed to produce copies of the plans, but it's not the same looking at them on the screen. And of course, the Americans named the Endeavour after Captain Cook's ship. And again, only just a couple of weeks ago, Musk did exactly the same thing. He named his, sp uh, his SpaceX after the American Endeavour, which in turn was after uh, Cook's Endeavour. So it's, um, it's a name with a fantastic provenance. So second contact, that's an image I took in 2004. And the result of all those, uh, all those um, expeditions, which were hundreds, they were coordinated by Paris. And one thing I didn't point out in that appeal for money to the king was uh, that the Royal Society was showing how the French, the, 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 the Swedes, the Russians, they were ahead of the game. England was behind the game at that time. And the French were leading the effort. Okay, in the 19th century, uh, the Sydney Observatory was quite important. It was still, <laughs> still photography. I could have said that it's still still photography because the movie hadn't been invented. But in in Sydney, they invented the revolver, which is a um, a, a rapid fire a rapid fire camera. And here's the, the Observatory of Sydney, which I was very interested to see because it's so like uh, a, a younger sibling of the Greenwich Observatory. That's their transit instrument. And I went to an evening of the stars there. Okay, these are pictures of 2004. I was at a school. It was fantastic timing because I had ingress to myself for half six. Then everybody from the milkman to the headmaster got a look on the way in. I got all of the physics classes out to observe it during the day and the morning's lessons and a break. It was self-service. And then when it was all over at uh, just before lunch, I had it all to myself again and I was recording Egress, there is a rugby clock. I always photograph a rugby clock so as I can synchronize my, my camera clock. But I did something awful. I tried to record the whole of the egress. So when I went to save, it just simply uh, froze. Uh, I, the memory was, was not up to it. 
Uh, I think David Arditti encountered a problem which might be explained by the same thing. But do be careful. I know memories are far better these days, but oh dear, I gave it to the IT department. They couldn't save it. It's one of those things. You've just lost it. The black drop effect was researched in 2001. Prior to this event, I was put down to optical limitations, which you can see from a photograph that I've taken there, quite poor. Um, I chose it as one of the poorer ones because you can see how it can lead to a black drop and also other reasons besides. It's a nice crisp image. 2012, I gave a version of this talk to the CERN Astronomical Society the night before. We're looking rather forlorn gray skies over the whole of Europe. Disappointing, but 2004 was fabulous. They didn't observe it in 2004 from space because they didn't have any filters on board the space station. Is that Don Pettit, I suppose? So uh, the Hubble was going to be used in 2012, looking at Aristarchus up here to look at the spectrum of Aristarchus to see if they could detect the carbon dioxide in the, um, in the atmosphere of Venus. Uh, it was a team from Grenoble University who won that um, proposal out of something like more than 100. And I felt bad about my video. The Hubble Space Telescope guidance system failed and they weren't able to uh, perform their observations. Okay, you've seen that. There's Venus's atmosphere in profile. We had the same atmosphere when the Earth was formed, but we, we with the help of some plants, uh, performed carbon capture. Uh, and that's why uh, we've locked up all, all of our carbon dioxide in, in rocks. And it was first detected on Venus in 1932 when Venus was the greatest elongation. They could then differentiate between the Venusian carbon dioxide and terrestrial carbon dioxide because Venus was approaching us at a maximum speed. So they were able to differentiate it by the Doppler shift. That was 1932. Magellan, okay, those are the images. I think that Russian probe finally arrived on the surface and lasted for a couple of hours. That's the list. Of course, we lost interest once we discovered what a hell it was and uh, then discovered that uh, Mars was rather more benign in comparison. Uh, <laughs> this was just put in for amusement. Uh, we're very tentative about our science uh, these days. We're very careful about it, but uh, not the Babylonians. That's the first recorded observation of Venus. They wrote their science in stone, literally. Um, now, just very quickly here, those are for various reasons. You couldn't observe those uh, transits from the UK in their entirety there in the winter when you've only got eight hours of sunshine anyway. Uh, but looking at this, I realized that actually, heck, that 2004 transit, which many of you will have seen, it was the very, very first time ever that, I'm um, sorry, that uh, a transit had been observed from, from, from England. I, I found that quite remarkable. And the next one that could be observed from England is in 200 years time. Uh, and you know, the odds are it's gonna be cloudy. So in that canon there of something like 700 years, perhaps we were the lucky ones to see that under absolutely perfect skies in 2004. Okay, I, I'm gonna move on now. Uh, Okay, that's the sort of epochal, uh, it's, it's rather like Saros's with eclipses, transits, they drift, those pairs will drift north, and then for a period, there'll only be one transit before the next one will come in. It's, it is, it has a parallel with Saros cycles for lunar eclipses and indeed solar eclipses. Uh, yes, I was looking forward to that observer's challenge. And of course, the reason why it followed the um, transit was because uh, it was so close to the plane of the ecliptic. Um, it, it just missed the sun. It was very close to the ecliptic. So that's why the observer challenge uh, did coincide on this event with the, um, uh, with the transit. And I'd be interested to know if any, perhaps somebody can tell me later about any results uh, of that challenge. Okay, secret instructions. Okay, I'll pass over this quite quickly now. But uh, the secret instructions were for him, for Cook to seek out what they thought was a great landmass underneath. That was the northern 
hemisphere, no northern hemisphere. Okay, they did know about the Arctic, uh, but they had no idea of the Antarctic. We now know that it's like that, which was discovered just over 200 years ago by an Irishman who was pressed into the Navy. He discovered that just over 200 years ago. But uh, they assumed there was a larger landmass to balance that landmass, which you can see occupies the northern hemisphere, because again, look, it's all sea. Um, all right, let me speed up now because uh, let's see, I've already been at it 40 minutes. That was what Cook did afterwards. He charted New Zealand, uh, some of his soundings still in use today. He landed at Botany Bay. After five days, he went north and he claimed uh, Australia for the crown when he was here just on the point of leaving, all, all, almost as an afterthought. And it's the most controversial action that Cook took because he was declaring it a terra nullius, which means an uninhabited land. And the, I, I've yet to do it, but there's, a, there's, a, there's some papers I've come across, studies in the history of the laws of nations, which I look forward to reading because it does explain the, the validity that these claims had, that people could just lay a claim like that. I read about a Frenchman who threw a bottle uh, um, overboard when he was off Perth in the hope the bottle would land and that would constitute a claim. Uh, that's for the future. Uh, and here you can see Endeavour River, that's where they ran aground, beached for five weeks to effect repairs. Uh, but I think this is quite important. <laughs> Okay, the first paragraph, never mind, it's the introduction. But look at the, what he was commanded to do by the, by the Admiralty, and, and do have no doubt about it in your mind. This was a scientific ex expedition to observe the transit of Venus, which the Admiralty piggybacked upon to seek out this terra australis incognita. Uh, but also, these were the terms which were laid out by the government. And just take a look at this. You are also, with the consent of the natives, to take possession of convenient situations in the country in the name of the King of Great Britain, or if you find the country uninhabited, take possession for His Majesty by setting up proper marks and inscriptions as first discoverers and possessors. As I say, these papers in the history of nations, uh, law of history of nations, will, will just back up quite what validity that had. Um, and that led to the concept of terra nullius, which I'll come back to in a minute. But here's something else that uh, was in the secret of the instructions of the whole crew not to divulge where they have been until they shall have permission to do so. So when after uh, Australia, they went to Batavia and uh, restocked, uh, they spent a couple of months there, all of the sailors had to keep silent. There's a lot more I could say about Cook. He was the first... Uh, the first captain to rise through the ranks because when he joined the Royal Navy from the Merchant Navy, he carried his skills forward with him, but not his rank, but uh, fear not, within the first week, he was already promoted to uh, captain's mate. Uh, as I say, he was first to go from, from AB to captain. He was, liked by his crew, he was good to his men, largely as a result, and also of his humble surroundings, because he was the first captain from such humble surroundings caused him some problems, but his skill uh, just put him on the par with those who had a more privileged background. So the first fleet was the result, 11 ships that sailed in 1788 with uh, using incidentally K1, they carried K1 with them for the journey. It then went to, um, after that, it went to HMS Victory. Those are the participants on the first fleet. Um, I've forgotten how many convicts and how many marines and how many sailors. That's Botany Bay. I've described it as not very pretty. La Perouse was a Frenchman who followed in Cook's footsteps and he sailed into Botany Bay two days after the first fleet. And this is the association now, but for lockdown, uh, I was going to visit the La Perouse Museum in Albi where he was born because he's one of the French uh, Navy's um, uh, heroes, 
And he basically took on the role of explorer of the Pacific after Cook died. He was funded similarly by King Louis XVI, who on the way to the guillotine, one of his last questions was, is there any news of La Perouse? There's a whole story about La Perouse, uh, which links up also with uh, Captain Bly, escapees from the colony. It's a fantastic story, but I don't have time for that here, but I do have some references on the last sheet. And incidentally, I did give this talk to the Flamsteed. If any of you are particularly keen to see that talk, I can pass the link, but I, I won't publicize that. That's Peruse's journeys, his perambulations. He was up here in Russia when he received orders from the Admiralty, the French Admiralty, to go to Botany Bay to seek out what the English were doing because they had wind of the, uh, of the First Fleet. Isn't it remarkable that he should receive instructions uh, whilst here? Uh, from the French Admiralty. I, I suppose they flooded every ship with instructions on the hope that one of them will at least find him. Um, okay, that's uh, something. Okay, the, okay, I'm passing over this now quickly. This is about the first fleet. Botany Bay wasn't a good place. They moved into Sydney. This is where they landed. Those brass studs mark out the coastline when they uh, landed. Uh, Australia Day, as it used to be known, was celebrated on the day that the first fleet arrived in Sydney Harbour, not when Cook arrived, nor when uh, the first fleet arrived in Botany Bay, but the invasion, it's now known as Invasion Day, look at the press on the 26th, 26th of January, you'll see that it's marked as uh, Invasion Day, the take today is quite different to in, in days of yore. This is the Museum of Sydney, that's the outline of the first house built by the governor. Um, and uh, you can see some of the excavation here, but out of respect for the indigenous people who would be upset to see such a reminder, they decided just to mark out the, uh, the, the foundations rather than exposing them, though I must say it's a little ironic when you look about yourself there. Okay. Um, yes, this is about the escapees. Uh, it's been fictionalized by... Uh, by uh, Meg, um, Meg Keneally, the daughter of um, Tom's Keneally, Tom Keneally, who wrote a book on the First Fleet. Uh, but this is a wonderful book which fictionalizes the escapees from the colony. Uh, but as I say, I don't have time for that maritime history, but you can follow it up. And that's the sea that they, they sailed. It's uh, the, the two of them, Bly and these escapees, they were doing it at the same time. There's Bly. Uh, he had K2 on board the bounty, but not on the ship when he was cast aside. Um, yeah, the scapees, they were taken, she was taken in hand meg by uh, Boswell, James Boswell. She was put up in the house in the street next to uh, Oxford Circus. She was taken to court, accused of having escaped. But when she told her story, the judge said, you've suffered enough and let her go. Finally, aftermath. Um, the Aboriginals had a history, an oral history. They didn't have a written history. They, and astronomy was an incredibly important part of their culture. And they knew the stars and it was an oral tradition. We have charts, we draw them, but they had an oral tradition and each star in the sky had, had a name and it had a role. Um, oh, this is... I'll pass over this. This is uh, Cook's observation of the natives. He was actually quite sympathetic to them. He could see that whilst they look wretched, they actually appear happier than Europeans. Uh, there's uh, the only fire we saw in Australia. The, the elders, Aboriginal elders, their help in controlling fires whilst we were there in Australia, they, they were turned down, which is extraordinary. But this is Professor Bill Gamage. He did some research and published this book just quite recently, where he revealed that the Aboriginal peoples, they had an incredible way of nurturing their environment. Uh, Cook and other people since have observed that Australia looked like a great estate, like one of these noble national trust estates. And it is because the Aboriginals tended the land in such a way that drew the wildlife into uh, their hunting grounds. And it was a very sophisticated system that's, that's only recently been discovered. Um, 
I came across some marvelous essays which are referred to here where, where Mark McKenna, who's a professor of history at Sydney, Australia, he, he talks quite remarkably about the secret instructions which Cook had, and also about the effect of the First Fleet on Australia. And he also talks at length about the nature of Aboriginal culture. This is aimed at upper sixth form students, which as history is not my subject, uh, suits me quite nicely. But I would recommend a read if you'd like to take this further. Okay, I've covered that. Now, this, this is very much the last slide. Um, I think we've all had clear outs of magazines and journals in the early days of furlough. And I did this with my British Astronomical, sorry, um, Royal Astronomical Society journals amongst others and threw most of them out, but I kept some of them and threw, a, but couldn't find one, which was covering the story of Aboriginal astronomy. And it was from 2006. So I went to the website to see if I could find it. And I was quite astonished to find that this article is here. Look, it's the most read since 2006, Astronomy and Aboriginal Culture. So I found it and I read through it and it's a difficult read. But the reason why it's uh, probably, no doubt it's the reason why it's the most popular read is because there was a case that I, that uh, was taken to court in 1982. And it was, a, uh, it was a judgment that took 10 years, but it was some claim to land rights that the Arab Aboriginal peoples were uh, taking to court. Uh, but the trouble is that the Aboriginal culture is an oral culture which is not recognized in Australian law. However, the authenticity of and the validity of the oral culture was um, reinforced by the astronomical uh, nature of the folklore and its role and how it had been passed down. And it gave a validity to the oral tradition which these uh, judges of appeal um, uh, allowed. Now, I can't pretend for one moment that you or I in one minute can get our heads around something that the judges took 10 years over. But the oral tradition is one which, which did validate their claim to their land and the role of the oral tradition in their knowledge of astronomy played a very important part. So um, I, I'll round off the talk by saying that if, if, um, if uh, astronomy lay at the root of the Aboriginal peoples losing dominion over their native lands back in 1788 in particular, following the 1769 visit of, of, of or 1770 visit of Cook. Uh, astronomy also was in large part responsible for restoring those rights. So I'll end with that. And as I say, um, lots of links on this next page, which, uh, which uh, yeah, I love that painting. Um, there we are. So do a screen capture or come back later. Uh, I've also referred to Martin's talk there down at the bottom. These aren't hyperlinked. Uh, some of the uh, links to Martin Lewis's talk, uh, they went on for a, a good paragraph. So just carefully type that in and you'll get his talk. Uh, so that's it. Um, how long did that take? About 50 minutes. Well, I've not broken the record for these webinars. So Andy, over to you. Thank you, Stuart, for a fascinating talk. Um, and actually think about it, what we could do is put some of those links onto the event page on the BA website. So there'll be a specific page for tonight okay. if you go and look on the events. All right, so I'll send this to you after the meeting. And I can copy and paste that into there. Okay, that'll, uh, and uh, hopefully the hyperlinks will work. But as I say, there are some good ones. There's, there's another one here about astronomy and Aboriginal culture, uh, Aboriginal stories of sea level rise which were authenticated by geologists at Sydney University when the Aboriginal peoples knew it all, all along. Uh, it talks about the, I mean, the Aboriginals, they walked across uh, when the uh, oceans were locked up in the ice caps and the sea levels were 120 meters below what they are now. And Sydney Harbour was, was, was flooded in a generation and that is in the oral history of the Aboriginal peoples. Okay, Andy, sorry, I'm... No, that's okay. <laughs> what, what we'll do is we're opening up to questions. So if you have a question, if, you'd, um, on your, if you're on Zoom, then if you move your mouse around and you're on a computer, you should see a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, although on some things, on tablets and possibly on some Macs, it might appear at the top of the screen and you can type your questions in there. I'll also try and keep a lookout on 
uh, YouTube in case anyone asks any questions there. And we've got about 120, 130 people with us across Zoom and YouTube. Oh, I thought you were going to say questions, Andy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, that would take a little while. Uh, we do have an initial one, which is actually from much earlier on when you asked a question just before the start. And this is from Adam Fairhead. And didn't Halley's Comet in 1066 change history? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think so, because I know that the uh, tapestry, it's not true to, to it, it's not true in as much as that um, Harold didn't die with an arrow in the eye. Um, and although it might be portrayed as casting, I mean, okay, it did, I'll put it this way, it did change history if you believe in astrology, because it was seen as an omen of, uh, of doom, and if, okay, in those days they believed it, fair enough, but I think we're a little bit more enlightened. So in our current knowledge, I would say not, but I think you're right, actually, in as much as it, it is a good one, I'll remember that, that uh, as perceived in the knowledge of science, in, in, in the knowledge of the people in that day, then yes, I'd say that it's, it's on a par because they would have blamed Halley's Comet, the English at least would have blamed Halley's Comet for, um, for their defeat. Thank you. And we also have a comment from Simon Street that um, 65 million years ago, a comet changed history. Yeah, fair enough. It was an event rather than an observation. <laughs> <laughs> unless you were, unless you were a, a dinosaur, in which case you might have uh, seen it. But yes, that was an event that certainly changed history. Uh, perhaps if I say that again, I'll make sure that um, uh, I talk about an observation. Thank you. Then we have a, a question in from Eddie Carpenter. Which is on Tahiti, was yes. Cook attacked by the locals and had to threaten them with a cannon set up on, on top of a wall? Yes, um, Tahiti was chosen the day after Cook was chosen, and they chose Cook not knowing where they would send him. But um, Captain Wallace returned with the Dolphin and the Swallow, is it? Uh, two boats. They returned the next day from Tahiti and they was described as a, as a very friendly place. In fact, um, it was so friendly, uh, it was so friendly that the, uh, that the sailors were getting favors from the native women there at the cost of nails on board the ship. And when the captain discovered that the sailors were taking these nails ashore, he put a quick stop to that. Anyway, no, it was decided that uh, Tahiti was the place to go to and he, he observed it. There was some hostility Yes, there was hostility. Uh, he had a quadrant stolen and there was a, a, a standoff on that occasion before he got it back. And the case for that is on ex exhibition in the Greenwich Observatory, or should I say the National Maritime Museum now. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the relationships weren't always cordial, um, but uh, it was on his third voyage that he called in Tahiti, went off uh, again, they, the, the mixed relationships, uh, they, they went off but had to return for repairs. And on that occasion, the boat was stolen and in the skirmish that followed, Cook was killed and buried at sea. Thank you. Um, next is from Tim Milton, a uh, great talk. And his question is, given the unpredictability of weather conditions, i.e. clear skies, wouldn't the Harrison clock method for determining accurate longitude always be more reliable than the astronomical method? Well, yes and no. To use the um, masculine, the lunar method, you have to find local time and then by determining local noon. So you've always got to perform, even with a Harrison or Kendall clock, you've still got to, to find local noon. So you do have to do that observation. So. I imagine that if it's cloudy, then, then you can't get an accurate fix on, 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 on your position. Uh, the one benefit, of course, of the clock method is that you get your result pretty well instantaneously, whereas I think I might have mentioned it took about half an hour to, to, to get your position from the, from the astronomical method. But as I say, it, it, it was surprisingly good. Um, next, we have a question from Diane. Um, do we have an idea as to the financial cost of Cook's voyage? Yeah, um, as I say, the rounded sums, they got £4,000 from the king, 
uh, um, Banksy paid four thousand uh, pounds. The Navy bought the uh, Endeavour. It had another name, Whitney Bay, I think it was. Uh, but it bought that ship for four, for two thousand three hundred and spent half as much again uh, refurbishing it. So that's three times four thousand. So it sounds sounds like something like about twelve thousand pounds. Whatever that is in millions, I do have a conversion here somewhere, but I don't think I'll find it in real time. And now we have a question, and excuse me if I get your surname incorrect, it's from Jim Meta. Hi Stuart, you made mention at the beginning about the two indigenous men in the painting. Ah, yes. Was there any significance to this? Yes, thank Great you. Talk, I, I, by the way. Yes, yes, good. Thanks, Jim. Hi, Jim. And you got the pronunciation right, Andy. Um, yes, uh, again, having to run through this, it, it, it again goes to the oral history, because uh, in 2005, uh, one of the uh, inhabitants of Botany Bay was interviewed and told the story of, I think it was an uncle or an aunt, who had heard the story recounted of the landing of Cook. So this is a di direct hand down of the story in the old tradition. And uh, this tradition did include talk of two to uh, men greeting the party. Uh, I'll also, whilst talking about that, um, the, the oral history, they had a sort of fail safe built in mechanism to avoid Chinese whispers that when, a, when the children were told the story by the parents, they would then have to go back to the grandparents to check the story, its authenticity, or at least its accuracy, I should say, to, to, um, to reduce the chances of Chinese whispers. Um Next, we have a question from David Arditi. Um, the lunar eclipse seen by natives of the Caribbean islands when Columbus was there changed history in a similar way. Columbus's mission survived because he could convince the natives he had predictive powers, ah. hence Latin America. Yes, 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 that's another good point. Yes, I, I, I recall that story, it's, it's at the back of my mind. Um, Having said that, yeah, uh, it, it might have been some other country. It might have been an Englishman or a Portuguese or another Spaniard who followed him. Um, but yes, that's a, a, an interesting take. Uh, the, the, I also read, whilst at Botany Bay, the idea that what if Peru's arrived before the first fleet and uh, laid claim to Australia there? Um, that's an interesting idea. Um, I, I suspect two reasons why that wouldn't have worked. You saw how many uh, you saw how many were in the first fleet, something like eleven hundred people, uh, whereas he only had uh, three ships. And besides, the story I didn't have time to tell was when he sailed from Botany Bay, he was lost, and that was one of the great mysteries of French maritime history, rather like the Erebus. Uh, Franklin's expedition to the Antarctic. Uh, it was a great mystery, which was solved definitively only quite recently. And the museum that I mentioned, which I was hoping to visit in the spring, uh, that, that opened only just a couple of years ago. So I, I'm making a note of these other events, Columbus, 1492. Good, thank you, David. Question from Simon Street. Um, great talk. What types of telescope did Cook take and use for observations and sizes? Right. He took a short 24 inch, which is not what you think. Um, short was maker. 24 inches was the focal length because that's how they measured telescopes in those days. Uh, but I can't remember, but I suppose it would have been something like a, a six or an eight inch uh, a six or an eight inch telescope. And it was standard issue because Maskelyne, he formulated, he produced a book, which uh, I've, I've got here on my laptop. Again, uh, permissions is, is why I didn't show you the uh, picture of Boyd's. Uh, I did apply for permission to show that, but uh, only yesterday when I double checked, I saw it took four to six weeks and I asked three weeks ago. But um, yeah, at the old 
uh, galleries at the National Maritime Museum, they had these on, on display and you can find them. And in fact, I think they've got one on the, in, the, in the museum now, but it was a, a reflecting telescope, as I say, 24 inches. It was standard issue. Masculine produced a book of instructions because as I said, there were dozens of expeditions the world over uh, led by uh, Masculine and they had a standard method to follow and they had standard uh, telescopes to use as well. So I hope that answers your question. And at the moment, that's it for the questions. I'll just check on YouTube. Nothing coming there. Um, so if there's no more, I'd like to thank Stuart once again for coming and give us a, a fascinating talk tonight on Cook and Venus and all the voyages. Um, and I'm just gonna for a minute, just to end, take over just to show for um, next week, uh, we have a slightly, um, we've got our usual Wednesday webinar, but a slightly different take to it, as we're having this one as well with the Society of Popular Astronomy, the SPA. So we're starting off with a seven o'clock talk on Jupiter at opposition by Dr. John Rogers, the director of the Jupiter section of the BAA. And that's gonna be followed up at quarter to eight um, by Myths and Illusions by Greg Smy Rumsby, designer, illustrator and author at Astronomy Now. Um, I would emphasize those times will always be approximate with meetings and webinars. Um, if anyone missed the beginning of tonight's talk, um, it will be available on YouTube to watch, um, as with all of our other webinars which we have. So thanks again, Stuart, and thanks for everyone for joining us. Okay, my See pleasure. You. I'll get that sheet of additional notes over to you straight away. Uh, yeah, and I'll put that out on the BA website on the event page for uh, Good. this webinar. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, many thanks. Bye.